Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be able to welcome Uli Applebaum, who is in Minneapolis. How are you doing, Uli? Doing great. Thanks for having me, John. A pleasure to be on your show today. Yeah, absolutely. And Uli is a... Um, is a well-known award-winning marketing and brand strategist and author and author of the book the let me just get the proper title here the brand positioning workbook a simple how-to guide to more compelling brand positioning faster and if you want to show them show everybody the yes, book yes absolutely here we go yeah oh, you see? There you yeah go. there you go perfect absolutely and so what we're going to talk about today is um the art and craft of brand positioning so, um, um, Uli, let's let's start off in uh, at a very basic level here, because I yeah. always like to do this because I really feel when it comes to brand that there are still people who think that brand is like the logos behind me or your colors or your tagline and all that. So, from from your point of view, explain it to everybody what you consider the meaning of brand to be. Yeah, and and that's a fundamental question, uh, John. Which which the interesting thing is, ask ten people what a brand is, and they're gonna get. <laughs> you'll get 12 responses, right? Um, <laughs> the way I define a brand is really everything a consumer or a desired audience or your, your uh, most important customers um, associate with your offering. Um, and that can be, um, you know, something they associate with your offering independently of everything you do or anything you do. But your job as a marketer is obviously to try to determine what are the core association you want my consumers to connect with my offering that will allow me to one stand out versus competition, but also be relevant, correct? And um, um, so that's really at the core what a brand is. It's the sum of the associations about your specific offering. And what I like about this definition, even though it's very simplistic, is, you know, on one hand, it makes it actionable, right? Because it allows you to um, if you, let's say, do an audit for a brand, understand why are people buying me, why are they not buying me, and what do they associate with my brand that might explain that behavior. And then in the second step, you can very simply go and say, what are really the desired brand associations I want to create with my offering? Um, and that, once you have defined those, which is a, a difficult task in itself, then you can determine everything you do, whether it's new product development, whether it's advertising, whether it's, you know, brand design of a website does it support and re reinforce my brand association does it work against it um, or does it do, do something completely uh, different than building my brand association within this case from my perspective this would be um, a waste of money and the points you're mm -hmm. referring to the logo the color maybe a tagline these kind of things those are brand assets um, yes and what they allow you to do is they allow you to uh, create recognition for a brand, right? If I tell you uh, 15 minutes can save you 15%, you probably will immediately recognize and a lot of your, your listeners will recognize mm -hmm. that I'm talking about uh, Geico um, yeah. because they've spent 20 years reinforcing this benefit or this claim mm -hmm. and associating it with, with their brand specifically. So yeah. that then turns into a brand asset that makes you think, oh, that's Geico. Yeah, they do insurance. Yeah. Oh yeah, they save you money. <laughs> Maybe I should check them out next time I, I sign up or look for an intern. So yeah. a slightly yeah. different thing. Yeah. Um, no, uh, th those are great points. Actually, just on the last one, I have to. There's a funny one from the UK when I was growing up in Ireland. Like we used to get a TV from the UK, and there was an insurance company, and I think their tagline was "We won't turn a drama into a crisis" or something. And and mm -hmm. the umbrella was their signature logo. Yes. And. Do you remember that? But but here's the here's the funny part. When they did a survey of people and they said, this logo, the umbrella, which insurance company? Most people got it wrong. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> so you better make sure that you create the right association and the right assets yeah. that people recognize your brand. Absolutely. Yeah. So here's here's another question. So you're coming up with your brand, as you said, it's it's um the associations with it and basically how people react to it but we often see marketers start off by what do we want to communicate about the brand you know what is it that we want and 
and they don't do that other part because at the end of the day it's really kind of it's a kind of a strange partnership isn't it between you and your your customers as to what mm -hmm. your or your prospects as to what your brand is actually going to be in the end mm -hmm. absolutely uh, to be honest you can blame them for that right but the, the right marketeers know that because when you think about the large organizations you know they have hundreds if not thousands of people that think about developing specific products specific technologies they spend millions and million dollars if not billions into innovation and research right so they live and breathe their product and their brand 24 7 and are really excited about that right so that's something they want to talk about mm -hmm. whereas for a consumer maybe they may get exposed to that brand or think about that brand um, let me give you a very simple example, a, a manufacturer of a toothpaste brand, very simple example, yeah. right? I'm sure they're like scientists doing research on, you know, the, the how to best clean the teeth, the different toothbrushes, all the technology and the science behind that. And you as a consumer, you think about brushing your teeth maybe, you know, twice a day, obviously, in the morning and in the evening. Mm -hmm. And then you think about buying a new brand of toothpaste, if you're lucky, maybe 10 seconds every month. Right. <laughs> so there is this massive disconnect between the energy and time spent by an organization um, uh, about their product and the time and amount of energy spent by a consumer about that very same uh, product or brand. And connecting the two is is the art of brand building or marketing, if you want, in a broader sense, uh, to really understand that understand the best context to position your brand in, in their lives um, and understand where and when to, to approach them when, um, when, you, um, uh, when you want to communicate to them, of course. But yes, this disconnect is there too. But to be honest, this disconnect is also there with the advertising agencies, right? Sure. Um, because yeah, yeah. the advertising agencies, they want to do lofty, emotional, beautiful <laughs> advertising that win awards. And so a lot of them lash onto this concept of a brand purpose, right? To save the planet with your toilet paper, you know, uh, save the dolphin with your toothpaste brand, mm -hmm. because that allows you to do very emotional um, communication. So you really have these tensions between, you know, a very strong product focus, a very strong sort of like emotional storytelling focus. And I guess in my position as a consultant, um, I'm sort of where, somewhere in between in the sense of mm -hmm. like, you know, I don't do advertising, right. I don't produce it. Um, and I try to help my clients turn their product, their product features into something that is relevant for their customers. Um, yeah. And sometimes it is a product attribute, but most often than not, it's trying to uh, understand how to position literally uh, an offering in a meaningful way in the life of their mm -hmm. customers. Yeah, and, and it's a good point that you raise because there are obviously a lot of brands who are trying to, uh, as you say, like expand the associations and make them maybe uh, maybe more relevant to what's going on in the world today. But that doesn't always but that doesn't always work because you're not always I mean, as you said, you're not always looking for that from a, this particular vendor of this particular product. Maybe you're looking for something a little more straightforward. Um, and I, And I think one of the other things is. Um, whether it's perceived or real, we perceive ourselves to be so overwhelmed, bombarded with messages from everywhere that we we don't even feel like we have time to to really um, process anything. Course, so I think yeah. that's another one, isn't it? You have to be you have to be careful about trying to keep your message kind of very targeted and very simple. Just because, as you said, you may think about toothpaste for ten seconds, you know, once a month in terms of purchasing. I um, mean, there's so many other things that are interrupting your life that getting anything through, through to you is tough. Yes. If you listen to many of the brands out there, they all want to become your partner, right? And yeah. your, your trusted partner. I, I don't want 200 trusted partner. I want a toothpaste <laughs> that tastes good and allows me to clean my teeth. You know what I mean? We, there used to be this old trick we used um, in advertising, which is, you know, if I take one tennis ball and throw it at you, you will be able to catch it, right? If I take four tennis balls in my two hands and throw them at you, good luck for you to try to catch even one of those balls, yeah. right? And the same with the associations you're trying to build or the message you're trying to create. But that, to, to close the loop to the previous point we had, mm -hmm. that's where the brand asset becomes key, right? So if you think about your toothpaste once a month, maybe for 10 seconds, 
and you think, oh, what tooth, brand of toothpaste should I buy? You know, should I continue to buy the one I have or should I look for another one? In that very moment, you want, you know, the red logo from Colgate to pop into your mind as Colgate, sure. obviously, um, for a consumer to think, Oh, yeah, I'm going to try those. I remember seeing that or, you know, I remember someone talking about that. But no one is going to do a sort of like scientific, sort of like rational analysis on, okay, here are four brands of toothpaste. Which one is scientifically better for me? You know, it's a, no one thinks about it in those terms, not yeah. even for the purchase of a big car or, or these kind of things. So, yes, we're very irrational and emotional in our purchase decisions. Yeah, it's another. Um, there's another one that I, I struck me recently um, was that you know pharmac- pharmacies here in the states, right? You know, you see CVS big red letters, Walgreens big letter big red letters, and once upon a time, Rite Aid used to be like blue big red letters as well. So, mm-hmm. and then Rite Aid changed their branding to this kind of subtle lime green and subtle blue, and. I've driven looking for pharmacies, you know, say, oh, I must drop into a pharmacy. I've driven past Rite Aids because I don't notice them anymore because Mm -hmm. they don't associate, I don't see the red and I see like the CVS down the road. So it's Mm -hmm. kind of, you have to be really careful about these things, especially if you do a a change like that. Absolutely. And color is one of the strongest brand signal, right? So um, again, you you don't, you you scan the aisle or you scan the environment around Mm -hmm. you. You don't like analyze everything you see. So color is one of the strongest sort of like cues you can send it. You know, the 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 red from Coca-Cola, you recognize it immediately. Mm. Um, it's a no-brainer. Um, yeah. Uh, so yes, absolutely. It's something you don't want to, you don't want to mess around with those assets um, once <laughs> you have established them, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing in in um, one of the one of the parts of your book, you talk about how biases uh, influence marketing decisions. Can you talk mm-hmm. to a little bit more about that? Absolutely. So, so biases, um, they're sort of like it's a popular term right now, right? Especially sure. in the cultural context. But the reality is, biases are not necessarily um, bad things, right? It's it's basically our specific, call it interpretation of what we see out there based on our experience, our history, our values and stuff like that. And But the problem with biases is they simplify our life, but I believe they prevent us from thinking really creatively. And what I mean with that is, you know, being creative means coming out of your comfort zone with an idea that hasn't been there before. Mm. In, in theory, that sounds very cool and sexy and exciting, right? Try to go to your boss and tell him, boss, I need uh, $50 million to try something we never tried before, and I'm not sure if it's going to work. Good luck with that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We're not wired to think creatively. And so you have a series of biases. The first one are very personal biases, sort of like, you know, the biggest one and and the one that probably the most popular or the most known is the confirmation bias. You know, I have a point of view, and I'm going to filter information based on what I believe and what I don't believe. And, you know, if you really want to go a uh, uh, polemic here, you can think about politics, right? Sure. Uh, there's always this debate between Republican and, and Democrats. When you listen to Democrats, it all makes sense. They all have the arguments to support their, their point of view. When you look at Republicans, from their perspective, it makes as much sense because they only focus on the tidbits of information, the facts, the stories, the anecdotes, that support their specific point of view. So confirmation bias is a, a strong one. Another one is, um, I forgot the name of it, John, but it, it's this notion, we all have that, right? Is um, we think that we are better at making decisions than anyone else. <laughs> you know? um, oh, look at my career, I've been tremendously successful. I've been in this business for 25 years. So what I think and what I conclude when I look at the data is probably more likely true than what the 15 other people in the room um, think, which, by the way, all these 15 people think the same, right? So uh, <laughs> this, this this tendency to overestimate your own judgment and experience is another bias that that um, mislead you or that can mislead you. So those are like the personal biases. Then you have obviously cultural biases, and uh, mm-hmm. sorry, corporate biases. This is like, you know, um, this is how we run business. This is how we build yeah. brands. This is what makes us successful. And they're all valid, right? Because they're often the result of 15, 20, 50, 100 years of successful brand building, right? So those become then the beliefs of 
nope, this is what we need to do in our category to build a brand or to build a business. So that's like the corporate biases. And the third type of biases, I call this a cultural bias, uh, because it's a fairly recent phenomenon I've observed like in the last 10, 15 years, um, and especially among younger, younger marketers mm-hmm. or younger strategies. It's this whole notion of everything needs a purpose, right? Yes. So it's this belief that everything I do from selling toilet paper to chemicals to butter needs a purpose behind it because it gives me, the strategist or the marketer, meaning. It gives meaning to the work I do, whether it's relevant to my consumer or not. It's mm-hmm. almost secondary. Again, that comes that's where the <laughs> confirmation bias comes back in, where you know, if I ask a consumer that I'm selling butter and my butter really helps make the world a better place, would you would you want something like that? Who's going to say no to that, mm-hmm. right? But ultimately, mm-hmm. they're not going to base their decision on that. No, I don't. So, so yeah. that's what I mean with this cultural bias, this thirst and quest for purpose in the life of the marketers and advertisers working on all these brands, which consumers, yeah. I don't think... Um, uh, aspire to as much as the, the professionals do. Yeah, no, I think to your point, like on the butter example there, you may say, oh, that's very interesting. You buy the butter. If the butter sucks, if it doesn't taste very good, you're like, yeah, this butter isn't changing my world. So it's uh, I'm not going to buy it uh, anytime soon again. And I think you're right. I think some people have crossed over into making that such a focus is that sometimes you look at brands today and you go, what are you what are you actually selling me or where, where can I yeah. find out something about the, the the product or service because all you're telling me about is how great you are and all the wonderful things you're doing to impact the world but yeah. right now I'm just kind of interested in how it's going to impact me that's absolutely right so you 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 in our pre-discussion you mentioned you moved to the US um, uh, around yeah. the dot-com boom type thing right so uh, mm-hmm. during the dot-com boom I was in Germany and did this analysis of effective dot-com advertising um, because at the time it was like everyone was going crazy in advertising you know everyone was claiming the rules the old rules don't apply anymore yeah. so they were sending like guinea pigs in cannons through targets and that was the advertising with a little logo mm-hmm. at the end and i looked at like 20 30 different um, cases of really successful uh, proven successful um, communication for for dot-coms and you know not surprisingly, the most successful communication was the one that clearly explained what the brand did and the benefit it provided. You know, so it's very simple explanations of what benefit this technology provided into the life of its consumers, as opposed to something completely crazy that didn't explain <laughs> anything or didn't you know make any sense. Um, mm. um, besides, besides having a shocking value in itself. Yeah, and we love being put on the spot, don't we? When somebody goes like, oh, here, I've got a riddle for you. Here's this. And you go, oh, shoot, I don't know. And now I start to feel really stupid. So, I mean, if you're advertising in the same way, it's not always the best. That is exactly Um, right. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit also, um, uh, uh, as we, the last part I just wanted to talk about is the, the human connection, defining the human connection. What's, what's, what, what, uh, what does that entail? So what I've learned, so and that's the, the, one of the, the premises of my book is there are 20 sources mm-hmm. of brand associations. Um, and one, and, and they can be divided into three groups. One has to do with the context or the context in which you position your brand. The other one has to do with the um, product and offering itself, whether you tell me about your brand to support, let's say, your benefit or your, your benefit statement. And the third part is how do you want to connect with your consumers, right? What do you tell them? How do you engage them to make your offering more relevant to, um, um, to them? And, and typically, this is where we speak or the industry speaks about the benefit, right? The emotional and the rational mm-hmm. benefit. That is sort of like this world. But when you think about that, um, it's very limiting. And so what, what I describe in this book is, is, I think, like eight or nine different ways to engage your consumers. And that can be things like, of course, there's the emotional, rational, or psychological benefit, right? But then there might be also a social benefit. Another way to engage your consumer is to celebrate the experience your brand provides. So it's an experiential benefit. Mm-hmm. One of the areas to connect with your consumers is 
the one I just criticized five minutes ago, it's to develop <laughs> a powerful brand purpose, right? Mm -hmm. But and, and brand purposes can be, I'm cynical about them, but they can be extremely powerful if they're genuine, right? So if a company yeah. really wants to do good in the world and really has a strong sustainability platform and you know, a very strong focus on, let's say, no animal testing or trying to do good in the world, then um, it can it can bring this to life in its brand strategy because it's going to resonate with a certain um, segment of the consumers out there. If it's just for communication purposes and to sound good, it's going to backfire very quickly. So a brand purpose might be a way to connect with your consumers and create this human connection. And another way to look at it might also be through and that's a whole chapter in itself through brand archetypes, right? The brand archetypes mm. are sort of like these um, uh, bundles of meaning. So these characters that really satisfy specific motivations and needs within with people. And I'm, I'm not speaking about consumers here, but people, because yeah. a lot of these archetypes are universal and timeless, right? So a typical example is the Harley Davidson hero archetype, right? It comes mm -hmm. into this, um, um, uh, sorry, outlaw archetype, not hero archetype, outlaw yeah, archetype. Yeah. You know, it's like, hey, I'm a dentist in my 60s. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm on my third wife and my life is boring as hell. <laughs> so I'm going to buy a Harley. I'm going to buy, you know, the whole Harley leather gear for $5,000. <laughs> and then every once a weekend uh, per year, I'm going to ride around and feel like a really <laughs> badass, um, you know, <laughs> outlaw. Uh, but that is very much what it is, you know. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. so it satisfies these needs, the open road, the revving engine that, you know, deserves the neighbors that everyone makes mm -hmm. you, you look at um, at, a, at a red light and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. For for a few moments, this, this motivation, this needs to be perceived as this badass outlaw is being satisfied, you know. But mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of them. It can be a completely uh, different one, like the innocent archetype, you know. That's when... People want, you know, pureness, uh, genuineness, um, you know, simplicity, um, you know, just just honesty. Um, there are moments and situations and categories where a specific consumer segment might might, you know, need one might want to satisfy this motivation. So, archetype is another way to engage consumers and to relate mm -hmm. to them. So, yeah, I think I just talked to four or five of them, and I think there are a total of yeah. eight or nine of those. Um, and the point being. There are way more ways to engage your consumer than simply say, here's a functional benefit and an emotional benefit, and here's why you should buy my brand. And obviously, all that depends on mm -hmm. what is your competition doing, um, you know, what are the core sort of like needs and drivers of your audience. And so the combination of the two allows you to determine how do I, how do I engage with them in the most meaningful way. Yeah, no, no, absolutely fantastic. Uh, th thanks, Uli. I mean, this has been this has been tremendous. Um, uh, and one of the things that you just mentioned there, I mean, I think that uh, all of these are all of these are are great as long as they're authentic. And I think that's mm -hmm. the piece, right? Yeah. As long as it's authentic, and it's not where somebody has said, "Oh, if we come off this way, then we will fool the Correct. people." I mean, you either are that way or you're not that way. And you talked about that in a previous podcast, right? So I hate the word authentic. Because, you know, especially in marketing, a good sort of like pressure test for all these concepts and word, words is to ask for the opposite, right? So mm -hmm. who would want to be seen as fake? Um, tell me yeah. one brand out there that would want to be seen as fake, none. So being seen as authentic, it, it's a bit of, of marketing BS. Um, it's completely irrelevant. It doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't, you know, yes, yes. It basically says you don't want to be seen as a liar, uh, you know, sneaky bastard who cheats mm -hmm. your consumers out of their money. That's yeah. not a platform for a brand. So, yeah, everyone wants to be yeah. authentic, I guess. Yeah. But I guess the thing now is because it's authentic has become such a buzzword and so trendy. It's like it's almost like the opposite. It's just saying, like, how do I how can I come off as more authentic? I mean, that's almost inauthentic in itself. That's right. More authentic <laughs> than authentic. It's like uh, uh, in the past, <laughs> uh, companies like Procter & Gamble were talking about not news because the news was sort of like so often used, like what's the news about yeah. my product? So they were talking about new news. So the news new that news. is newer than the news before. 
So that feels a bit the same in, in the world of authenticity. It's like maybe the authentic authenticity. That's what we're looking for now. Yeah, so, exactly. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, listen, all of Uli's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Yes, absolutely. So I have a hybrid role. So um, I'm primarily a brand consultant. I run my own little company called First the Trousers, Then the Shoes. We are based here in uh, Minneapolis, but we operate, you can hear I'm German. We operate all over the world and, and in Europe as well. Um, and I really help organizations vary from small entrepreneurs to large global multi-billion dollar organization with everything around, you know, understanding their customers, positioning their brands, going to market, et cetera, et cetera. So that is sort of like um, my main gig. But then I also work, we talked earlier about brand assets. I do a lot of contract work for a, a global design agency that I help mm -hmm. with um, uh, developing brand design or the strategy behind brand design. So uh, maybe that's a reflection of my ADHD and just the desire to work <laughs> on a variety of different projects. Um, but they all have to do with brand associations and mm -hmm. brand assets. And uh, so that's how I... I bring it together in my own little brain so that's how i'm my authentic Perfect. self um in my own yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your 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 authentic authentic self obviously. correct <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and the book is called the brand positioning workbook a simple how-to guide to more compelling brand positioning and faster and if you could flash the book again just so yes. our visual people there you go I would highly encourage you to check it out. Uh, available on Amazon and all good booksellers. Uh, check out Uli's work as well. Listen, thanks again, Uli. Uh, it was fantastic. Great insights. Thank you for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again soon. Thanks for having me, John.